Greetings, folks, and welcome back to the BMW Motorrad podcast. Here we are at episode two already. So, what have we got lined up for you this time? First up, we'll take a journey back to the future and speak to Dr. Ralph Rodepater about the new Vision DC Roadster and how the brand's past is already influencing its electrified future. Then, we'll be looking ahead to the International GS Trophy in New Zealand and speaking to Thomas Fisher, who's responsible for BMW Motorrad's North African and Middle Eastern markets, both of which are fielding teams for the first time in the trophy. We'll also have a chat with Pete Gerards, one of the lucky guys from Team Nederland, another newbie team that it's making its debut in 2020. And if we've got time, we'll have a quick chat about the upcoming Pure and Crafted Festival, which is coming to Amsterdam on 28th of September. Can't wait for that one. It's great to have you here again, so let's get on with the show. Imagine a time in the future when the internal combustion engine is no more and the only motorcycle manufacturers that remain are the ones that have successfully pursued electrification. We are riders. We'll always want to ride. But what could a future BMW bike be like 10, 20, 30 years from now? One possible answer could be in the form of the Vision DC Roadster, a highly emotional naked bike with electric drive. If you recognize this music, you'll have seen this zero emissions riding concept recently unveiled at the next gen event in Munich. Its first public outing was at BMW Motorrad Days, where I caught up with Head of Marketing and Product Management, Dr. Ralph Rodepater, to tell us more about the possible electrical awakening of the Boxer engine. So this is the BMW Motorrad Vision DC Roadster that was unveiled at hashtag next gen event in Munich. How has the reaction been from visitors here so far at BMW Motorrad days? Yeah, having the Vision DC Roadster here in, in Garmisch at the Motorrad days is great because we first, for the first time, we show it to a wider audience uh, after the hashtag next gen where the audience was quite small compared with BMW Motorrad days. And the reaction was great. Uh, I think from the first side, you see that it is a BMW Motorrad because our design department did a very great job by putting design elements from our standard, from our history, actually, into that Vision DC Roadster. Especially when you think about 1923, when we invented our first motorcycle, it was the same idea, putting the boxer engine, uh, putting the cylinder heads into the wind. And they took over the same idea of putting now these cooling elements uh, into the wind, not only for, for riding to cool the, the engine down, also for charging. You have a lot of heat development during charging. So you need these, um, these elements to get get rid of the heat that's brilliant that's a very modern interpretation of a, of a classic idea but just to clarify for listeners what's the difference between a concept bike and a vision bike a vision bike always tells the audience or are also tries to to do something that is quite far away so when we talk about vision we are talking about yeah a mid-range of four five six or more years um when we talk about concept that is always quite close to the serial production so when you always or whenever you hear the the word concept you can be sure that there will be a serial bike within the next one or two years. But a vision bike is really trying out something, trying the reactions of the audience. Uh, is it a direction we could go? For example, now for the uh, Vision DC road, sir, it is really, is that our design language for electrified motorcycles? So we have been very successful with the sea evolution in the in the last years with our electric scooter, but bringing that to the into motorcycles is a totally different question. So because uh, the technique will define a new design language, so we have to test and we have to be very creative and test out the ideas of how a motorcycle, an electrified motorcycle, could look like in the future. So there's a reason why we call it vision. And it was a definite move and, and, and certainly a move that's worked to have that typical BMW Motorrad DNA in there. Yeah, that it was very important for us to think about, hey, we are coming from now nearly 100 years of history of, and of course, we are very much linked to the boxer engine. How can we make sure that somebody who sees a motorcycle of us, regardless, is it an internal combustion engine or is it an electrified engine, to make a typical look like a BMW? 
tell us when we're talking about boxer engines because there's a space where a boxer engine would normally be what's in that space actually we're talking also about an engine of course it's an electrified engine and in the space where we have now in the combustion engines the pistons the cylinder head and all this stuff we decided to use this as a as it was thought from the beginning to cool down to get rid of the heat um, of an internal combustion engine or also electrified engines are producing heat even if that is on a lower scale but on the other side when you park your combustion engine bike somewhere the heat is off but not when you're charging an electri electrified bike so there is the most of the heat uh, production so we decided to try out to have this vent in there and these cooling elements so that air is really floating through there and take away the heat like it is in an internal combustion engine boxer brilliant sounds like a fantastic solution now I love the looks of this bike. It seems to me, at least, that the designers, they haven't built a bike and then made an e-drive system to fit it. But they've actually started with the motor and the battery and the shaft drive and then designed a whole motorcycle around those key elements. That is absolutely right. That were the basic ideas to take this key element that make a BMW motorrad visible as being a BMW motorrad and take this key element and, of course, transform them into a modern modern looking and to make sure that this could be the design language of our electrified bikes yeah so i mean it certainly looks cool it's low at the front it's high at the rear and and, and that design gives it a, a lightweight sporty agile stance have you also thought you know the materials that are used in its construction does does that all also all about lightweight as well low weight Today, the range of an electrified uh, engine is still quite low compared with a combustion engine. So it is very important to have a very efficient, not only efficient engine, but also a very efficient bike. So, of course, we took as much lightweight into it, carbon fiber, aluminum, all this stuff to make it as light as possible. Um, because, yeah, efficiency is not only a, a question of con combustion engines, also for the future and even more for the future with electrified engines. I just want to talk about sound because how bikes sound is a really important element. To many riders um, so what might the future sound of an electric bike be because i don't think electric bikes are going to be silent in the future are they for sure they will not be silent and actually if you look today with a combustion engine as long as a motorcycle or also a car is very slow you hear the engine but as it becomes faster you do not hear the engine anymore you hear the wheels and you hear the wind and you hear everything but not anymore the engine so of course we thought a lot about the engine the future sound of motorcycling but there the opinion will change because we will find find electric engines not only in motorcycles we will have them in cars more and more so I think we both, we are a little bit too old because we are so used to this internal combustion engine, very masculine sound. Um, and we will have another definition of masculine sound in the future. And I'm presuming you can choose whatever your preference is going to be. I guess it won't be, you know, like a standard thing. You can uh, pick, your, pick your pitch, so to speak. Absolutely. As we do it today with the combustion engines, it is not the sound comes out from alone there. So we are thinking a lot about the sound. How could the technique be reflected in the sound? And that holds true also for electrified engines. So a scooter will definitely sound different from a, from a roadster. Uh, from the DC Roadster or the Vision DC Roadster, it of course will be much more present as as it is with a with a scooter that is mainly for urban use. Apparently, there's some matching rider clothing at Smart Suit uh, to go with the new Vision bike. So, what can you tell us about this two piece item? It certainly doesn't look like your typical rider equipment that we recognize today. <laughs> yeah, that is absolutely right, and we have a lot of ideas what you can. Do with the rider equipment today that is very separated from the bike mainly we're talking about protection so for in case of an accident that it protects the, the rider but of course with modern techniques you have much much more possibilities to really link the bike and the rider and the suit uh, the rider equipment is perfect for that so starting with the helmet starting with the jacket and the suit um, you can really put a lot of functions of the bike into the suit and you can steer your 
bike by using the suit. So have a lot of functions, not anymore at the handlebar of the bike, but in your in your clothes. And imagine that you steer it with your voice on, and all this stuff. You have a head-up display in the helmet and all that stuff that can be a bit, uh, imaginable. And there are a lot of new technologies are coming. You find them already. You find ski, Googles, which gives you the, the speed and such things. So, of course, we are transforming that also in our, into our ride equipment. And like you say, it's not that far away. Definitely not, no. <laughs> Something that's very important to motorcyclists. Obviously, we're getting clear messages uh, about highly automated vehicles transforming our individual mobility of the future. You know, for example, your smartphone is going to call an empty car that's going to come and pick you up and you p perhaps carry on your business or your entertainment or have a snooze in there. Uh, but riding a motorcycle, you know, even a zero emissions concept like the Vision DC Roadster, it's such an engaging, emotional activity that we wouldn't want taken out of our hands. Will we always be able to ride our motorcycles if they are BMW Motorrad motorcycles? I promise it will always be riding a BMW motorcycle. But there, the new technique gives us room for so many degrees of freedom. So imagine you had your wonderful weekends in the Alps doing one curve after the other. And now it's a Saturday afternoon and you're riding back to the north of Germany. You're tired, you had a wonderful weekend, but then perhaps you are happy that your motorcycle is riding for you. So, of course, we have it in our hands and we want to ride motorcycles and it is in the the bike should do what I want. But there are also situations where I say, hey, just take me home. I like the idea of that, charging around the Alps for a couple of hours and then uh, going for a snooze on the boring bits in the autobahn. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. all possible, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the far future, I could think of that, yeah. Okay, so, so drivers for sure are going to be able to choose whether they want to drive autonomously or drive themselves. It sounds like it might be the case for motorcyclists as well, but one thing's for sure, pioneering brands like BMW Motorrad will never take the emotion and the fun out of riding, even when the internal combustion engine is obsolete and we're all enjoying super fast, super efficient, zero emissions e-bikes. Are you confident that's still going to be the case? That will definitely be the case. And what we definitely will never ever do is take out the emotion of it. If For everybody who has ridden an electric bike or even a scooter, it is highly emotional because you have this lot of talk there. So starting at the traffic light, you're always a winner with that. So there's definitely no lack of emotions when we're talking about electrified motorcycles. Definitely not, I promise. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks very much for the insights, Ralph. It's uh, certainly looking a very interesting future BMW Motorrad style. Thank you, Andy. Get ready for the ultimate off-road event and check out gstrophy.com. So the trophy's coming closer. And for 2019, we've got some new teams who will be tasting international GS Trophy action for the first time. Among them are teams from the Middle East and North Africa. And helping them get there in good shape is a good guy called Mr. Fisher. Hey, Thomas, tell us who you are and what you do. Well, uh, my name is Thomas Fisher. Since two and a half years, I have uh, the pleasure to take care of the importer markets in the Middle East and Caribbean African markets. So very, very different cultures, and uh, but so, so interesting cultures and uh, also characters I, I, I can take care of. It sounds like a dream job to me. So fantastic news that two new regions of the world are being represented in the International GS Trophy 2020. Can you tell us a little bit about these? Yeah, we, we are very happy that uh, finally we could make it. Uh, I, I think uh, having um, especially Morocco uh, in the North Africa, which is, I would say, one of the most fantastic places I've been for motorbike riding, finally we have the possibility to have the first North African qualifier there. Uh, people from Algeria and also Tunisia will come to Morocco and participate. So that will be quite a big event. On the other side of the uh, of the world, we have the Middle East markets where our GS community is fast growing. Uh, Lebanon uh, and Dubai, Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, Jordan. 
and in future maybe even more markets uh, which which we're trying to develop there in Lebanon it definitely uh, makes sense to bring the people together yeah I mean I, I just wanted to ask you that when I think of North Africa and when I think of the Middle East I would have thought those riding conditions are perfect for GS bikes and certainly with a lot of sand as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, we had some, some years ago the GS uh, launch in Morocco already and uh, all my colleagues and all people uh, participating in this uh, launch uh, call it the legendary GS launch because it was uh, just, it's just the perfect condition for this bike. We have uh, a travel partner there. We're building up an enduro park as well and uh, it definitely is a country to to go and the accessibility from especially from europe uh, is uh, very easy one and a half hours by ship from spain not so easy i guess in the middle east but still probably an, an amazing place to ride a gs absolutely yes um of course we have uh, due to the i would say the the quite differences in the climate uh, throughout the year it is difficult to pl find places uh, with a green landscape especially in uh, Saudi Arabia and, and, and Dubai or the Arab Emirates in, in general uh, but we have uh, Oman for instance in the southern part uh, where uh, Saudi Arabia and Dubai are also doing uh, off-road trainings and, and travels And of course, uh, in Lebanon, we have the perfect conditions um, and also a very big community uh, and doing a lot of off-road riding and on-road riding and trainings as well. And so when, when will this qualifier be? Both qualifiers will be in September uh, this year, of course. Um, we have uh, from the 12th to the 13th the qualifier in uh, the Middle East and already one week No, two weeks later, we will have uh, the qualifier in uh, Morocco. Fantastic. Any female riders involved in any of these qualifiers? Yes, that was uh, actually very interesting for me. Um, I thought uh, Middle East would be difficult to find female riders, but uh, we have uh, two, f no, actually three female riders. We have uh, Grace and... Uh, um, Maya, uh, both uh, are from the Middle East directly. One is from Lebanon and one is from Jordan. And uh, we also have the pleasure that uh, Rosie Gabriel will be there, uh, a very uh, famous motorcyclist uh, who is uh, doing uh, off-road uh, tours in the Middle East since, I think she told me, seven or eight years and uh, she's originally from Canada but uh, since she's already that long in the in the region we consider her as part of of the game yeah? fantastic and in North Africa in North Africa we I think we also will have uh, two or three female riders the names I do not know right now but uh, the only challenge we have uh, that uh, I guess the The female qualifier will be very soon after our qualifiers. So we need to make sure that the female riders already have their visa ready in order to participate in Spain. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And, and what does it mean? I mean, you've, you've been out there already and you've met these riders. What does it mean to them to have the chance to participate, to be part of the GS Trophy community? I think especially in the Middle East, yeah, this is something unique. I mean... There is a lot of money in the Middle East, but uh, participating in a qualifier can't be bought. So uh, this is, I guess, uh, the most interesting thing for them, yeah? That it's absolutely equal for everybody and it's about competing against each other uh, no matter where you're coming from, how rich you are, or uh, if you're female or male. Yeah, That's absolutely brilliant. Well, we wish you the very, very best of luck moving forwards with those qualifiers. Thomas, thanks for talking to us. And, uh, of course, the best of luck to all the riders hoping to represent Team North Africa and Team Middle East in the International GS Trophy 2020. Welcome to the family. Thank you very much. We hope to win there in New Zealand. <laughs> Now, as you've just heard, we'll have teams from North Africa and the Middle East. There's also a new team from the Nordic countries, and also Team Nederland making a debut in the international event. I managed to get one of the Dutch team members on the line, Peit Gerards, who could hardly contain his excitement about what lies ahead in New Zealand. Hey Pete, great to have you on board, and welcome to the GS family. How excited are you about going to New Zealand? 
I think I'm the most exciting guy on the planet at the moment because it's 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 once in a lifetime and um I cannot imagine how great it's going to be. Absolutely. And now you've got two teammates um who can't be here with you today because they're busy racing GSs in Gibraltar. What can you tell me about your teammates and what they're up to at the moment? Yeah, I've got two very good teammates. Um uh, Jaap van Hofwegen, he's 35 years old. He's uh, a very good rider and he's very intelligent. He's um, analyzing the track. He's looking at everything and then he's going to ride. Then you have Xavier Tobbe. He's a very talented rider. He's 22 years old, so he's, 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 a, he's the young guy. <laughs> um, yeah, he just had so much talent and he did some uh, um, racing on his uh, um, uh, bicycle. Um, so he's also very strong, very good um, uh, condition. So uh, that's great. So I think we are all three, we are uh, different as a person, but as a team, we have a very good click. So um, we are very happy with that. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the GS scene in the Netherlands. Is it is it growing? Is it developing? Um, the GS scene in the Netherlands uh, this is the first time the Netherlands uh, enters the GS Trophy. So um, the good thing about that is uh, it's pretty new. So everything we do is um, new for the people. And BMW, the Netherlands, is doing a very great job because um, from beginning to the end, they will, um, uh, how do you say that? They will um, assist us. Yeah. And they will, um, um, let's start before the qualify. Before the qualify, we came uh, together with um, all the participants uh, for the for the qualify, and all of them got a bike for three weeks, and we could train on the bike. It was a F850 GS, and we could take the bike to the UK where we had to qualify. So that was the first thing we did together with BMW the Netherlands. So did you all ride across to the UK together, or did you make your own way across? I think 80 percent uh, rode together. We all came to the BMW dealer in um, Cheltenham. And from Cheltenham, we rode to the GS Trophy Qualifier in the UK. So we came with all the orange F850 GSs to the qualifiers. So that was pretty cool. So we had a good, we had a good entry over there. <laughs> yeah, it must have looked fantastic when you all turned up. And of course, you, you did your qualifier in, in South Wales at the uh, BMW Off-Road School with Dakar legend Cy Pavey and his team. So how was that experience? Did they look after you well down there? Yeah, it was, that was great. The, we, we rode at the Walters Arena. And uh, yeah, I think Simon is a legend. He had, uh, he had a presentation also in the evening with changing tires and just some storytelling. And he himself, he thought, okay, there will maybe three people uh, coming to the presentation, but the complete room was full, full of people that everybody was interested in his story. So he was surprised himself too, but it was, it was, it was great. It was just one big family, also together with the, with the guys from the UK. So uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that, that's absolutely fantastic. And, and that's the uh, GS community in a nutshell, really. But, but for you personally, what's special about GS bikes? Yeah, I own a 1200 uh, GS Rally from 2017. But I had a BMW uh, G450X before. That's a more enduro bike. The first time I rode the GS, I was in love. And I really understood, uh, understood what GS is all about. Because normally when you have a regular bike and you ride on it, the bike is not giving you the freedom to do everything you want. And with the GS, I can do everything I want. When I see uh, a, a field with, with, with sand, I can over the field or just an uh, uh, off-road track, the GS will not stop you. So in terms of riding your GS, where do you go in the Netherlands to ride? Yeah, well, what, what I do, I think it's, I'm not the typical GS rider myself because I like really extreme stuff. So... Um, for uh, as a hobby, I do motocross and um, uh, off-roading with with some smaller dirt bikes. And um, now I really like to do that with the BMW GS too. I did some motocross tracks on the GS. I do some uh, enduro rides so that in the Netherlands you have in the um, winter time you've got enduros, and then it's about um, 45 to 50 kilometers is around, and you and you can do a couple rounds with some smaller dirt bikes. 
but I do that with the GS because I think it's a little bit too extreme for the GS. But when you do that enduro, you can learn a lot. And I really like to learn every day on the bike. So that's why I do that. <laughs> so what kind of uh, reactions are you getting from the riders on the smaller dirt bikes when you're heading out on these long tracks on the, on the big GS? It was crazy. People did not expect that you can do things like that with a BMW GS. Because everybody thinks, as GF, of everybody sees a GS running on the road, but it will not uh, stop you for a ride off-road. And it's just the rider that can, um, how do you say that? The rider makes the limit. The bike will not stop you. <laughs> I suppose another way of saying it is, is, you know, the bike can do it, the GS can do it. It's all down to the ability of the rider. Yeah, and, and when you look at videos from the, you know, previous videos from the GS Trophy from past editions, how does it make you feel knowing that you're going to be part of that experience? Yeah, it's, it's very special because you, 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 tr you train a lot for that. Um, and you, you look at videos and you see how people ride the bikes and you take a look at the, um, uh, at the trails you have to do. Um, but the trip to New Zealand, it's, it's not there yet. We are now... Uh, enjoying the moment, um, what what for example the BMW the Netherlands is doing. Uh, next week we will get a new, of this week we will get a new BMW F850 for training, and the training itself is also very nice because we're gonna train together with the team, and it's not only training on the bike, but it's also uh, physical training. Uh, we will do some uh, uh, um, how do you call that a medical approval. Um, they will uh, send us to a, a sports uh, doctor and he will um, check everything from us, how fit we are. So all the things we are doing together as a team, yeah, that's great. Ah, oh, that sounds fantastic. You know, so you're going to have to stop eating the uh, poffages and the uh, strof waffles and all those things that we love to we love to stuff our faces with when we go to the Netherlands and get yourself as fit as possible. It is the first time... Uh, BME Motorrad, the Netherlands, is um, taking part for the Jazz Trophy. And I think uh, hopefully we're going to do a nice entry. But um, for us, I think uh, also as, as when I speak for uh, Xavier and Jaap, for us it's, it's 3,000 kilometers of podium what we're going to ride over there because we already managed to go over there and that's just a tip of the iceberg. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, so many people have said exactly the same thing to me. Just to get there in the first place, you know, makes you a winner. And it's fantastic that, that BMW Netherlands is taking it so seriously and, and really joining in with the spirit of the event. So what about other teams? Are you in contact with any of the uh, other guys and girls who are going to be in New Zealand yet? Yes, actually, yes. Um, that's the cool thing about... Um uh, 2019 we have internet and we have social media and on instagram you can do hashtag gs trophy 2020 and you can see people who post things about the gs trophy and um of course we did um the qualified together with the guys from the uk and you don't know each other good but you have the same passion and that makes a conversation very easy so um i talked to a couple of people and I'm very excited about that to see them in New Zealand. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, it's you know, it's it's absolutely as you find as the uh, year progresses, you'll have a lot of a lot more people coming into contact with you, and the family grows. And by the time you actually get to New Zealand, you already know most of the other participants. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. Let's uh, let's make it an adventure. Okay, well, listen, it's been fantastic talking to you, Pete, and, and really good luck to you and the other two guys for the rest of the preparations. Thanks, mate. We'll see us. Bye-bye. Music, motorcycles, heritage, handmade and much more. Pure and Crafted is back, but not in Berlin. This time it's landing in Amsterdam on Saturday the 28th of September with a pre-party club night on the Friday evening and an invitation to the Distinguished Gentleman's Ride on the Sunday. Here to tell us more about this legendary action-packed festival is BMW Motorrad's Michael Trammer. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. Hi, Andy. Good to see you. <laughs> so, after three years in Berlin, Pure and Crafted is going international. 
Ja, absolut. Ja, so, uh, after three years uh, Pure and Crafted in Berlin and one year uh, Pure and Crafted on the road, which we did uh, last year. Now we thought it's the time uh, maybe to uh, bring Pure and Crafted also uh, to some other European city. And in fact, uh, now we're going to Amsterdam and Amsterdam, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Pure and Crafted uh, 2019. Where is it and when is it, Michael? The festival itself uh, will take place on the 28th of September. Uh, and this will be at uh, the Tats uh, Art and Event Park in Sandam, which is very near uh, to Amsterdam and easy to reach. And um, so this is uh, the place to be for the whole day on the 28th. Uh, we also will offer uh, yeah, a kind of a pre-opening party, a club night in a club downtown Amsterdam. This club is not confirmed yet, but uh, so we will meet there uh, on uh, Friday night already, also with live music and uh, yeah, with a good portion of uh, pure and crafted lifestyle. This will be on the 27th and uh, last but not least um, on uh, Sunday the 29th uh, there will uh, be the um, distinguished gentleman's ride. So this is uh, a ride which Which, uh, takes place uh, at the same time uh, in many uh, cities all over the world. Uh, on Sunday, we will meet again at uh, Tats uh, Art and Event Park for a breakfast, uh, and then uh, yeah, meet um, other riders. And from there, uh, we will ride to the starting point uh, of the distinguished gentleman's ride. Uh, so for a long weekend, uh, so this in combination maybe with uh, some sightseeing in Amsterdam, I think it's a, a cool thing uh, to come over, over and uh, yeah, join the Pure and Crafted Festival and have a city trip to Amsterdam. Yeah, what a great choice of location. Um, Amsterdam is a really great place to visit and the festival site is really easy to get to apparently. It's uh, quite easy to get there. So uh, the festival location of Pure and Crafted uh, 2019 in Amsterdam uh, will be Uh, the uh, Tats uh, Art and Event Park and uh, the Tats uh, actually is uh, located in uh, Zandam doesn't matter if you arrive uh, at the central station or uh, at Chipol Airport it's uh, just half an hour uh, to get there and uh, also by bike or car uh, it's uh, quite easy yeah no, no that's perfect I mean you want to make some noise you want to have loads of people turning up on their bikes and uh, being able to park so in terms of the event itself, how would you sum it up, pure and crafted? How would you sum it up in a nutshell? So it's not only a music festival. Uh, we will also have uh, a general store uh, in which uh, a lot of vendors uh, will uh, offer their goods like denim jeans, for example, like uh, handmade leather goods, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and of course, uh, we added um, yeah, motorcycle culture. That means uh, we will have um, a wheels area. We call it wheels area, and in that wheels area, uh, we will have a lot of uh, custom garages uh, and custom builders uh, who will be presenting their coolest custom bikes. And then of course, BMW Motorrad uh, will have a brand appearance on location. We also will bring our uh, best bikes there, and um, yeah, and then also uh, a wall of death uh, will be presented. So this will be uh, Ken Fox and his troop from uh, the UK that together uh, of course with um, yeah, um, a good choice of uh, F&B excellent drinks and um, yeah, food trucks uh, that it's uh, all part of the Pure and Crafted Festival oh, Sounds fantastic, so there's great music loads of exhibitors specializing in quality handcrafted goods, a big choice of different street food, sounds like it's going to be a really cool vibe at this festival Is it suitable for all the family? Absolutely. So uh, we will open doors at noon already. Everyone is welcome and uh, especially uh, also kids. And so I would say for uh, the whole family, it's the perfect place to be and spend a, a beautiful day in autumn. Now, is it a free event like BMW Motorrad Days or do you need tickets for this one? For this one, you uh, will need tickets. Uh, I would say it's uh, 25 euros, all uh, taxes and services included. And so... Uh, and then you get uh, the entrance for the whole day. Sounds fantastic. So how can people register or, or simply find out more about it? 
the easiest thing is to uh, follow us on uh, Facebook or Instagram. Uh, of course, we will have uh, uh, running a website, and uh, this is pureandcrafted.com. And on the website, you also can uh, order tickets. Uh, so we do that together with the Ticketmaster. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so just uh, visit the website, uh, follow us, and then you uh, stay informed. Okay, super. Okay, so thanks for talking to us, Michael. I'm definitely going to be in Amsterdam over that long weekend, the final weekend of September. And hopefully we'll uh, do live streams, of course, over the weekend. Cheers, mate. Annie, thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward uh, to meeting you there in Amsterdam. See you. I'm sure you're wondering what the uh, cool music is in the background. Well, I can tell you it's uh, London-based band Swedish Def Candy who will be live on stage at Pure and Craft on the 28th of September with Sons, Indian Askin, Bad Nerves and more. See you there. That's it for now, folks. It's been great having you along for the ride again. We've got more awesome content lined up for episode three, so why not subscribe now and it'll find its way automatically to wherever your podcasts land. As always, we'd love to hear from you with your own ideas and suggestions on what you'd like to hear in a future podcast. So please do get in touch via social media as we love a bit of interaction. Remember the hashtag BMWMotorabPodcast. Okay, this is Andy Dukes signing off. As always, don't forget to make your life a ride. Bye for now.